Okay, so I'm going to present today in English because I don't think I need to make you suffer through my Finnish language. Um, today, I'm, I'm really pleased that this project was chosen not only because it's mine, but because there's been quite a lot of bad stories about development cooperation in the news over the last year or so. And so I think it's really great that we can tell a story of one that is successful because it's your taxpayers' money, my taxpayers' money that's going to produce this project. So it's uh, very nice that it has been a success. So just very briefly about FCG, um, we've been working for about 50 years almost uh, in one year. It'll be 50 years that we've done development cooperation. Um, and it began as part of the work of Kuntalito many years ago. And uh, we've been focusing on organisational and social and public sector activities worldwide, as well as here in Finland, of course. And the slogan is Working for Wellbeing, which I think matches very nicely to the project. And we cover a lot of areas. We've, I mean, I haven't even included everything there. We've had projects in education, in blood transfusion, in all sorts of things. <coughs> so, in Nepal, um, we've been working particularly with the Finnish funded cooperation for about 26 years now. Um, this project is the very first one on the list there. And well, actually, it's the, it's the third phase of it is the first one on the list. Um, the project that won was the second phase. We're now implementing the third phase, which is quite a large project, as you can see, about 33 million euros in total. And it's probable that we're also going to get a grant from the EU of another 20 million euros as of next year because they've been so satisfied with the project. Um, we're also implementing the other Finnish funded rural water supply and sanitation project. And both of these are built on an earlier series of projects called the Lumbini projects. We've also just finished an environment and administration project in Nepal and a land use, uh, sorry, a land and regional waste management project. As well as uh, over the years, we've had various activities in education in Nepal. Now we're working with many other donors, but we're very strong, particularly with the Finnish funding. As I said, um, you know, there's been a series of projects to get us to um, this one here, which is the one that won the prize. Um, Finland over the years has become really famous in Nepal for delivering water and sanitation in very remote areas. Uh, it's not an easy place to work and people really appreciate the fact that Finland has become associated with that. Even during the Civil War when most of the other donors pulled out, Finland kept working in the water and sanitation. So where are we? Um, this is India down here, China up there, so quite a hot spot to be in between. Um, this is the Rural Water Res uh, Resource Management Project here, and this is the other ongoing water and sanitation project. And most of those districts up there, are, I think nine out of 10 of our districts are in the lowest category of the Human Development Index in Nepal, so they're definitely deserving of assistance. And this is what it looks like. Getting to the project sites is very difficult. Most of it is what they call the mid-hills, but we would call mountains. Um, and the roads don't go all the way there. Where there are roads, there's a lot of landslides, so you often have to stop and wait, even overnight, for the roads to be cleared. And then you get to some point down here at the roadhead, and you have to walk. So we do a lot of walking in this project. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> these were areas where the Civil War started back in the 1990s uh, due to a lot of conflicts caused by different ethnicities and castes and language and religion and all sorts of things. So there are a lot of issues there and it really needed a lot of support. It was an area that tended to be forgotten really over the past years. They would, on the maps, they didn't even mark anything much past the border for the far west. It was sort of like there be dragons on the old English maps. <laughs> and this is what it looks like when we get out to the field. So as you can see, it's very, very steep. And anything that has to be carried in is carried in on people's backs. It's not on cars usually. And if you think back to 2006, before the first phase of this project started, none of these villages had water. So the women would be getting up 
maybe 4 a.m. to go and start collecting water, which might be an hour and a half, two hours away walking and carrying very heavy loads of water back again. And of course, they'd have to do that many times a day. Um, also, they're preparing food in the dark because there's no electricity. And uh, they didn't have very much food. Um, even though it looked very fertile, people just didn't have a tradition of growing much in the way of vegetables. They would grow rice or maize, but not really a mixture of vegetables. So their nutrition was very bad and they also didn't have irrigation systems. So generally speaking, throughout the dry season, they had no crop. So very bad food security. And that meant also there was a lot of people um, without toilets. The majority didn't have toilets until the last few years. So that led to a lot of disease and diarrhea, a lot of children dying young. So times have changed. This has really had an impact at the highest level, this project, because now you have chubby children and families who are eating much better. Women have spare time because they're not spending the entire day walking. They, usually what we're doing is constructing a public tap in the village. Um, and also we're using a lot of systems to make sure that there is better gender equality. I don't expect you to read all this, but I just highlighted the key things of what we're doing there, really. So this is the structure of the project. And the main areas are water and sanitation, livelihoods development, so that's home gardens, food security, cooperative development, etc., and then building the capacity at the local level. <coughs> so what did we do? Building rural water and sanitation, as I said, usually to public taps. Um, encouraging people to build toilets, explaining the reasons why. We've been very involved in the national sanitation campaign and most people are building a, a horsey type arrangement, only generally there people like to have a water flush system, so they pour in a little bit of water and they wash with water, they don't have toilet paper. So that's another reason why you really need water to have something like that function. Livelihoods, cooperatives, nobody had anywhere to do savings and keep their money. So now there's a lot of people involved with cooperative movement. Um, that's something we can bring from the finished success in cooperatives. Renewable energy. As I say, most people would start the morning making the food at like 4 a.m. In, in pitch darkness. And uh, I'd have to say, it gets very dark there. Come about six o'clock, it's pitch black and you go to bed very early. And if you can see on the other side of the mountain, there's some lights twinkling from a, a micro hydro scheme. That's a very tempting thing and people are really very keen to get micro hydro. Um, I'll run through some of these issues later. Then we have these tools that we use. So there's very detailed project implementation guidelines, water use master plan system, the step-by-step -step using a multiple use systems and this human rights based approach, gender and social inclusion guidelines. So what did we get? So everything is based around water. So that's the key. The water is, everything is related to water, be it micro hydro or irrigation or home gardens or sanitation, everything comes from that. So this is roughly speaking, you know, counting how many um, people we've served with these different activities. And then you can see some of the other indicators that we have, like the low weight children, there's half the number of low weight children now. They're eating much better. Um, less diarrhea, a lot of capacity development. Uh, school and institutional toilets as well is something that we've supported the construction of because generally speaking, girls in particular won't go to school once they get to teenage uh, age because they can't go to school if there's not a separate female toilet where they can uh, wash if they've got menstruation. Improved cooking stoves. These are small stoves that have a chimney, so the women aren't cooking in a very smoky room anymore. The children aren't falling in the fire. They've been a big hit. Improved water mills, irrigation. Okay, so we overshot the targets by quite a lot. I haven't bothered putting the figures on because it, <laughs> it becomes too detailed, but you can see already by the second year, we were overshooting our target, achieving more here, even more again. At this point, we had a midterm evaluation and they increased the target, so we just still overshot it a tiny bit. 
and we achieved quite a lot more by the end. So it was very successful. Um, <coughs> it surpassed the target by 77% originally, and then we got some extra funds after the midterm evaluation. Once the ministry saw it was going so well, they thought, OK, let's give some more money. And so we overshot that as well. Um, almost the entire area where we've been working is now covered with water supply, 99%, and 102 out of, uh, sorry, 112 out of 113 VDCs, which is like the Kunta equivalent, are now open defecation free, which means everybody has a toilet. And this 1% where the water supply isn't covering is usually something that's been just out of our hands. There's been a big landslide. The earthquake did a bit of damage. Management. This is our current team leader uh, and one of our other staff. So uh, we have a project team with Finnish and uh, local staff. Um, many of them have worked for us for many years. I think the one who's been there the longest has been 20 years working for the company in a series of different projects. So very good institutional memory. And then we, have, we work with 10 different districts. So within each of those districts, we have our expert staff, national staff, and also local facilitator teams. And they work with the local government in each of those districts. Um, so then we have to plan. That means it's quite complicated to do the planning, to have regular meetings. Um, we try to, for instance, do at least a weekly meeting and do very detailed notes so that we can share them on the email with everyone who isn't there so they know what's happening. Um, we work very closely with the local government, which is not easy because they have a lot of rotation. Um, we're constantly having to rebrief local government employees because they're new to the area. <coughs> um, from the original 52 Kunta equivalent, then we had another 62 added during the project phase. And by the end, we then phased out of the original ones and have now taken on new ones. So it's sort of a rolling program now. Um, we have a supervisory board where the Embassy of Finland participates and the different ministries from the Nepali side. And of course, our staff, and they're making the the high-level decisions. Um, I know the theme of this program has been that permission to fail, but we're not really allowed to fail in development cooperation because, as I think you're very aware, you get quite a kicking if anything fails, so we have to make sure it really works from the start. And we're also very focused on results-based management. So originally in development cooperation, there was a bit of a tendency, and I think in local government, to focus on the activities, on how many people have been trained or how many toilets have been built or whatever. Now we try to focus much higher level. So what are the real substantive results that we're achieving? And we try to report on those and keep following them. These are just some examples of some of the tools. These are the water use master plans. So when we first go into a district or a, a VDC, a Kunta, we sit with the community and we go through this process to see what water resources there are in the community. Uh, there's technical measurements of what the potential is physically and also looking at the social issues and then doing a prioritisation process where we try to see what are the most important projects. Is it irrigation? Is it water supply, etc. Then once we get to the actual little projects within that, for instance, this is a step-by-step -step process for drinking water. So we start down here and we have you know, the government level approvals and we have gov uh, community mappings and feasibility studies. Again, very detailed technical engineering review, but also community study. Um, we're looking at training. We have to have water use um, committees who manage it locally. It's very much decentralised to those committees rather than it being the government who does it. Um, we give them a lot of training and at each step they also do audits. So whatever money goes to their bank account, they have to respond to the community and there's public audits which deal with that. And so it goes through a very detailed process and this is something that's been developed over the many years that we've been working with the water projects in Nepal. So we've sort of worked out what works and what doesn't work and this seems to be quite efficient. You know, at the end of the day you find sometimes that some committees at the end will start skipping on some steps. Sometimes 
that works. Um, they adapt it to local setups, but sometimes it doesn't work so well because it means returning to business as usual before the project was there. So we try to make sure that they're not skipping the very important things. This is the water use master planning. They do a lot of this <coughs> um, participatory rural appraisal, so mapping the community, getting everyone to participate and say where everybody's living, where there's a particularly disadvantaged household with Dalits or disabled people, for instance, who might not be able to come out, um, where the water supply is, where the roads are, if there are any, that sort of thing. And as part of this, we also do confidence building workshops for women in each area so that they have the confidence to stand up in the public meetings and talk about their issues because otherwise you get the men doing all the talking but when it comes to water it's, it's women's business really and the women are the ones who know what the problems are with the water so we try to sit them down and have a women only training for a couple of days to give them the confidence to actually voice things out loud in a protected environment so then when they go to the bigger meeting they're more confident about speaking. And this step-by-step -step process, as I showed, we think that's very useful because um, it, there's a very clear path that everyone knows has to happen. If there's a problem, we get complaints. You know, people will contact the project and say, we don't think they've followed this part of the step. You know, what are you going to do about it? For instance, if the procurement goes astray, if they think that people are just asking for quotes from their friends. We hear about it and it gets investigated. Um, and it's been a very good way of building capacity at the lowest level. So people really know how to do the construction themselves and they have a lot more ownership. <coughs> Here's an example of a public audit happening. So water supply, <coughs> Finland is supporting the achievement of the right to water and sanitation. Finland and Nepal have both signed this. This is a United Nations right, uh, a declaration. And that means that both in Finland and in Nepal, everybody has the right to clean, reasonable quality water that's reasonably accessible. Um, and the standards that we try for in Nepal are a 15 minute round trip for water, including waiting time. That should be no more than that and uh, you should have water all the time. Um, we also say it's a quantity thing of 45 litres per person per day is the basic that we're aiming for and it shouldn't be contaminated. So there's certain you know, standards that we're applying, government standards. Um, and likewise, sanitation, everyone has the right to use their own toilet. Now that doesn't mean that we have to build it for everybody. We, we're very clear on that. The National Sanitation Program says that we shouldn't be subsidising toilets. People have to build them themselves. Otherwise, you'll find that you know, they don't have ownership and they'll just use the toilet for storage. <coughs> um, this menstruation status is a, is a tricky one and we're still really struggling with that. In a lot of those areas in the far west of Nepal, women are considered untouchable when they're menstruating. So not only can they not touch their husband during that time, but they're often kept outside of the house in a little shed for five days and not allowed into the house at all. Um, they can't touch the tap in many villages. They can't use the toilet, we've recently discovered, in many villages because they might make it dirty, which sounds bizarre to us, but <laughs> anyway, it's something that we're doing a huge amount of campaigning on, working with local religious leaders, um, the elderly, who are often the people who are enforcing these rules, trying to make people understand that it's bad for everybody if the menstruating women are kept out of the system. So, yeah, typical toilet built by this family. Uh, we support the National Sanitation Campaign, so we do a lot of this behaviour change communication activities. So trying to see, OK, what, what are the key things that we can talk about that people will be interested in as a, as a trigger. We don't want them to just think, oh yes, you ought to use the toilet because otherwise it's dirty and, you know, we've, we tried that for many years and it doesn't work. What you really have to do is create a feeling in here that this is disgusting and I am risking my child's health 
or educational status if I don't get everybody in the village using the toilet. So everything we're doing now, we're trying to think about this behaviour change thing so that it's not just that they know it here, they have to know it here as well. <coughs> Disability. Um, one thing that's quite tricky is that, I mean, there are quite a lot of people with disabilities, particularly up in the hills, it's very difficult to use a toilet because most people have a squat toilet like this. Now, this gentleman was very pleased to have this squat toilet, but he has very deformed legs, so he said it's really very difficult to squat. So we've been promoting different ideas, be it just a rope on the back of the door that people can hang on to for a bit of support, or taking one of these plastic chairs that are ubiquitous throughout Nepal and cutting a hole in it. And you can just lift it and put it over the toilet. So we've been doing work with local uh, foundations, associations for people with disabilities and also individual homeowners just to give them ideas as to what they can do to improve their access. Um, Multi-use systems. We think it's very important because usually there isn't enough water to do everything. So you have to try and make some choices. And the best possible idea is to reuse the water in every possible way. So that might mean, for instance, taking a microhydro scheme and doing that together with irrigation, or drinking water and a, a water trough for the animals and uh, hydropower all together. So trying to really make every drop count. And we're also doing a lot of work on the livelihoods. So that can mean even if there isn't enough water for drinking, which is the priority, you can use leftover water from hand washing or dishwashing, clothes washing, whatever, and put it into a drip system like this. And there's a little filter there, it filters out the rubbish, and you can use that in a little drip system for vegetables, which that lady's got there. And that's been incredibly popular. Um, and then, you know, if there's sufficient water, we can plan for something bigger, like microhydro schemes, which I, I hasten to add are very small. Um, they're not hydropower, they're really just one pipe diverted from the river, um, or even commercial production. So here's a few people doing commercial production. And this is an example of the sort of microhydro scheme we have, which is sort of anywhere between 15 and 100 kilowatts, so not very big, on average only about 45 kilowatts. So quite small schemes, but they make a lot of difference. On the right, there's an improved water mill as well, which is another um, small technology, very tiny little water mill that we just put better uh, shafts on and they work much more effectively. That's an improved water mill in the middle. I'll just skip through these a bit so we don't run too much out of time. We've introduced some new technologies as well as these water mills. Oh, there's the improved cooking stove, but this one's a hydram pump, a hydraulic ram pump, which is really fascinating. It requires no power. In that one in particular, for instance, there was water just dropping from a spring about two to three metres onto this pump, and about 10% of the water gets taken up the hill just with the force of the water, and it can go up to 60 metres. So we've introduced those, and at first our engineers said, ah, it'll never work. But now they're very enthusiastic and they're replicating it. Quite a lot. So the project communication challenges we've certainly got. I mean, as Timo mentioned, often the phones don't work, no internet, walking, uh, physical access continues to be a difficulty. It's improving as time goes by, but it's still quite difficult. Um, there's also a problem of donor mentality. If there's been a project, even quite small NGO projects earlier, people have a tendency to think that you're gonna give me something. And we don't want to create that handout feeling. We want people to know that it's up to them, that we can give a bit of a leg up, but they've got to do the work themselves. So for instance, we have to be very strict to say at the start, we're going to do this and then that's it. You have to keep it running yourselves. Um, so our staff have to work quite a lot at at talking to the communities and to the local government about that. <coughs> also, the project's a long way away from the capital, so that makes it quite difficult to communicate with the national level. But we've been try trying quite hard to do the dissemination in scientific publications, in conferences, in national level workshops, etc. 
as I said earlier, I think institutional memory is probably one of the biggest things. We've got a team, many of whom have worked for us for many years, and there's a real team spirit. They talk about the RV family. So when I sent a message yesterday to everybody saying, oh, we won, everyone's been so excited. I've been getting emails all day and night, and on Facebook they've put it, and <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, so they're really dedicated and enthusiastic about the work. We've got these good systems we've developed. Um, we've got some action research links. We have some Finnish and Nepali researchers who work alongside us. Uh, and so they're constantly producing new ideas, giving us a bit of a nudge on things. And we've got a close relationship. I'm in the home office, but also others. And we have this other Finnish large water project. So we've had some exchanges of staff and we share, we produce this sort of thing together between the projects. And for instance here, these were some of our engineers who straight after the earthquake, they were very enthusiastic to do something. So they went along and joined the national earthquake assessment. So they went out for a few weeks and checked what the damage had been. And I think there's a lot of moving away from technical assistance projects, but I still think particularly in a place like this that's so remote, there's definitely a role. It's no good. It, theoretically, it sounds good to be able to give money and let the locals decide how to use it. But unfortunately, when you see what happens, often things go wrong. And I think it is really useful to have people on hand, either Finns or other international people, or local staff who aren't inside the community, who can be these sort of change makers and really give people a poke, you know, say, no, no, we can't do it like that. That's not fair. You're, you're treating the Dalits unfairly or you, know, you have to let the women participate in this meeting and that sort of thing, as well as giving, of course, technical advi advice. <coughs> um, we've got very good national policies in Nepal, but they just don't tend to trickle down because of these communication issues. It is so far away. So things don't get down to the grassroots unless you have people pushing. <coughs> and there is a, still a lack of local democracy and corruption and a lot of problems still in the local government system, which is gradually improving, but it takes time. So I think that there is still a role for projects, and uh, I think this has been a good example of one. Okay. Thank you, Mamela. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really amazing what they have done in such a conditions. Do you agree? <laughs> so now there is time for questions. Yeah. Yes, that's really excellent work you have done, but I, I'd like to know uh, on top of the monthly meetings that you mentioned, how do you communicate to the higher level? Okay, so we have different levels. We have the project support unit, which is in sort of based in the main office in the far west. And we have um, the chief technical advisor and the other international advisor and a, ju a Finnish junior expert there. And we have several different specialists, national specialists there, might maybe uh, engineer, sanitation advisor, capacity building, different posts like that. So everybody is travelling a lot out to each of the districts. So the districts are quite a long way away. Just to get to the very first district takes four hours of very windy road. And then it's only just, I think, last year that we were able to reach the ninth district by road. The tenth one you have to fly, it's up in the Himalaya, so there's no way. So they're definitely the ones that tend to miss out a bit. But the others now all have internet, though it comes and goes a lot. So they can be on the email and the phone from the district headquarters. But yeah, we have the weekly meetings, we have reporting um, where all the districts have to send in their reports and they get pulled together. Um, we've got a blog uh, where we encourage the staff to be writing things. Um, and then there's the, there is a steering committee, and in Finnish projects, normally the steering committee is the local level government people, and they're normally the ones that know the most about the project and where the real decisions are made. 
But we find in Nepal that because those local level staff are rotated so often, they don't know enough really to make a lot of decisions. So most of the decisions are made higher up in Kathmandu in the supervisory board. And that's a couple of times a year, but also then there's visits. We have visits from the central level government people coming out to visit the project sites. Um, and we go up for um, sector meetings of different sorts, water sector, agriculture, that sort of thing. So there's quite a lot of opportunities, but it's just not super easy. You can't say to everyone, let's all have a meeting now. You have to pick strategic moments. So for instance, this week they'll be having an uh, internal coordination meeting because it's the end of the Tiha holiday and that's like Diwali, it's, it's the Festival of Lights, it's one of the biggest holidays and so everyone's coming back from wherever they live and they'll be passing through the office so we take that sort of opportunity to have a few days to everybody to sit down and discuss the project. We do, yes, <laughs> we do. Um, they have been very successful, these ones. Um, we've done, for instance, we've been doing, um, using mobile phones uh, together with the government with this Aquaflow application to do a online monitoring of all the water supply per district. So we've just finished, I think, the third one. I haven't seen the results of that yet. But that's looking at both our project areas and non-project areas and consistently, even in the areas where we're finished, our schemes are working much better than the non-government areas. Also, uh, as I said, there was this other project, the Lumbini project, which started in 89-90 and ran through until 2006, <coughs> I think. Um, so over quite a long period, slightly different area to this one. But there was a country evaluation of Nepal some years back and they were sort of randomly visiting old water schemes that were part of that project. And after the first few days, it all was going so well that the team thought that the locals were somehow setting it up and only taking them to the good schemes. So they started to change things and in the morning they'd say, okay, we're not going to that one, we're going to this one. And still they found they were all working. <laughs> so it's been remarkably successful. And I would say part of the reason has been they've been built better than the average water scheme. There's been much more attention paid, which of course means they're more expensive to start with. We've got more technical assistance on hand. We have local facilitators who are living in the village and making sure that everything goes right. But we find that if, if the community builds it, rather than the government building it and just handing it over, then the local community has the ownership and they, you know, they've put their money and their effort into building it and it's what they wanted in the first place, you've got a much better success. So it's more expensive to start with, but then it survives. As I say, there'll be a few schemes that go just because there's such bad landslides and there's not much we can do about that. We've tried to do a lot of work on design, um, trying to do you know, geological uh, checks on the surrounding area and building up with rocks and protecting the area, but you can't pre prevent everything really. in the project itself. Yeah. I mean, there's three, there's, there's a, a Finnish team leader, there's a second post, and there's a Finnish junior. And then in phase two, I think we had um, nine specialists. And then we had in each district, 
uh, a sort of general boss of the district plus an engineer. So a water resources manager and then an engineer plus, you know, there might be a admin person or whatever. Uh, that's in each district, so there's 10 of them. And then in every district, the local government is employing, with some finished money, um, local facilitators. So it might be an NGO or it might be a direct employment, and that's usually some sort of technical engineer person and a health promoter and a livelihoods promoter to work at the village level. So they're actually living there, and that seems to be a really big difference. When you talk to local government employees and say, what's the difference between the way we're doing it and the way you do it normally, they say the big difference is that. Because otherwise, there's money going in, but the prioritisation is different. It'll be the noisiest people, the confident people, the one who are richer to start with, who get the water scheme near their house. And the people who are lower caste or not very good at speaking up, the very poor, they're the ones who miss out. Whereas we find that th that's quite a different setup if we have our local facilitators there because they're doing this ongoing training and talking and making sure that everybody is participating in meetings and people aren't missing out. Now, of course, you know, some local people might say, well, hey, you're, why are you coming in there with your Nordic ideas of you know, equality and human rights and it's nothing to do with you, you're being colonials. But, I mean, human rights are human rights. They're, they're not divisible. They're, everybody has a right to water and sanitation. It's not just the higher caste people. So originally, at the, in 2006, in some of the project areas, you would have situations where they, they would say, oh, there's only enough water for one tap, but you need to build another tap so the Daleks can have that so they don't contaminate ours. And, of course, you could say pragmatically, well, maybe it's better for the Daleks if they do have another tap because then you know they'll get some water. But if there isn't enough water, you know, we can't buy into that because that would imply that we think that's OK, that we think there is something wrong with the Dalit. So we have to work through that and discuss, and gradually that has changed. Now the big thing we're trying to change is this menstruating women taboo, that there isn't anything wrong with them, you know? <laughs> And, you know, some people have said, oh, why don't you just build a separate toilet for menstruating women? So pragmatically, that would be a sensible idea. But that means that we think there's something wrong with the women. So we can't really be seen to be doing that. So we have to discuss it and try and get it to change gradually so that everyone understands the equality. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.